Welcome back into another edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Cameron Dicker hits a last second field goal against Atlanta Falcons this weekend and the Falcons lose 20 to 17 to the Chargers at home. They fall one game below 500 on the season. He's Dave Archer, DJ Shockley. I'm Derek Rackley. We're going to talk about all things that happen in that game and then we're going to turn the page because mm-hmm. we got to turn the page quickly this yeah, week, we fellas. Hey, we got a game coming up here uh, as we record this show in about 24 hours. So, or excuse me, 48 hours. So we got to we got to move on to the Panthers. But let's start with the Chargers, Dave. Let's start with some some first reactions here. We are kind of talking about next week, but we'll come back after losing this game. Is it getting to the point to where it's a must-win situation this week on Thursday? Yeah, I don't think it's a must win unless you're being eliminated, right? Yeah. But because you're one and two in the division, and now you're tied with Tampa again, who's two and one in the division, if you begin to start doing the math, then you think you can't drop a division game, right? You need to win the division game. So, but it, unless you're being eliminated, I don't ever like to use the must win scenario. Got it. DJ, what about you? Yeah, I thought similar. Uh, obviously, with where you stand, um, is, you know, Arch has mentioned. Uh, where Tampa stands, and obviously, you know, they got a big win at the end over the Rams. Uh, I don't like to say must win either, unless it's, you know, the last game of the season and it's going to get you in the playoffs. But other than that, I think you still got a lot of football left to play. But I do understand the importance of winning inside your division. Yeah, That's a big deal. So, in that sense of must win, I think, yeah. But for the entirety of the season, still got a lot of ball to play. Yeah, no, I feel you guys. I understand which direction you're going. I'm going to flip it slightly on you guys and take some of what like like the coaches would tell us. Uh-huh. Guess what? Every week in the NFL it's is a must win situation. <laughs> so they're not saying over there, oh, guys, you know, it's just okay. if Let's just go out there and play our best, and if it's not good, no. The guys on the team and the coaching staff, they're saying we're going out to win the freaking game this week. Yeah. So that's kind of what some of the reactions are. Fans, you probably are looking at it saying, yes, it is a must win if they want to stay pace mm-hmm. in the division. Um, but let's talk about what happened this past game. Because, Dave, we talked about it before we walked in the studio here this morning. Kind of a weird game. Like, Falcons came out like gangbusters, just marching down the field. They come up short on the second drive, but they still get points on the board. And then all of a sudden you click over into the second quarter – and like it's like a different game, two different teams. Atlanta kind of slows down. The Chargers kind of speed up a little bit. What was your take? What was the kind of shift in momentum between quarter one and two? Well, it felt like that the, when you got down there the second drive, and I think you, you penetrated maybe the eight, the ten yard line. I can't remember. You're right around the ten yard line. Don't get in, and you have to kick a field goal. I felt like that was a bit of a deflator because you had been you'd been really been pushing them around. Mm-hmm. You had the big run by Algier in the opening drive. You had you had a lot going on. Uh, you were able to mix in some pass. You kind of were dictating throughout the entire part of those first two drives. I mean, I looked at the play sheet, and I said Atlanta had run 21 plays, and, and the Chargers had run three. Yeah. Wow. And I'm going, wow. Just yeah. you talk about domination. You had like you had the ball for like 12 minutes and 12 and a half minutes of the first quarter, and you only had 10 points. Yeah. And you, it felt kind of a little deflating there. And I think the Chargers got a little bit of a boost that they got a stop down there. It, made mm-hmm. it, it was only 10 nothing. Um, and let's say 14 nothing. how much difference is that? I don't know. You go down and you, two, you punch two touchdowns in the first two times you touch it. That feels a little bit different than getting sure. stopped and yeah. kicking a field goal. I felt like the, the Chargers got a little bit of momentum off of that and, and then started to put some things together in the second quarter. DJ, it's got it's got to be one of those situations, though, where Atlanta gets up 10 nothing on the Chargers in the first quarter, and you got to feel like you're in a good position, but then you got to think – at some point, Herbert's going to figure this out. Like, he's a top five, call it, quarterback in the league for a reason. And, Dave, you talked about the two touchdowns would have felt better. The Chargers respond with two touchdowns in the second quarter, and it really just kind of flipped the game around. Yeah, you think early in the ball game there wasn't – I don't want to say much attention, but the Chargers are trying to do other things with their offense. And then they said, okay, we got a dude back here, number 30, that can really make things happen. Mm-hmm. And they started feeding him in multiple ways out the backfield, started you know, giving it to him, and he was making some plays, making some positive runs. And – I think early in the ball game, the Falcons were really good on early downs. I mean, you're talking about first and second down were really big for them, and they were able to, you know, be in third and short or, or maybe not sometimes even get to third down. And then you get to that second quarter, and the Falcons have, what is it, like three straight three and outs or something like that. And now, okay, here the defense gains confidence for the Chargers. Now their offense starts to pick up. And, and Eckler starts to get going a little bit. They give it to him, uh, and he ends up taking it down. But this was, I, I thought, just most some of the time was a lack of execution um, as far as hitting some guys, some guys dropping some balls, some guys, uh, you know, 
Mariota not really hitting a lot of guys sometimes. I mean, it, it was a multitude of things that culminated in why they were able to come back. Uh, it just wasn't one or two guys, but obviously – your execution that second quarter, I think, didn't match what you had going on in the first. Yeah, and I think if you're looking for a play to look at that kind of flipped the thing, the script for, for the Chargers was a third, third and 15, 15 play from yeah. their own 10-yard mm-hmm. line or 12-yard line, and your rush doesn't quite do what you're looking for it to do. You wanted to push Herbert left or right. When he escapes Lines. forward, it's a problem because he's got a big arm, he can throw on the move, or he can take off, like most quarterbacks. But if you shove him either way, he his percentage goes way down when you shove him out the other direction, cut the field in half. He escaped forward, found Palmer on that deep end cut, and that got him going. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, boom. Then they, they converted six consecutive third downs from yeah. that point on, which led to the two touchdowns. At that point, you'd kind of been had him off his sorts. He was kind of not feeling it, and he wasn't finding guys. And the next thing you know, he got the ball to Palmer, got some of the receivers. We knew he wasn't working with Williams or Allen in right, the game. Right. So I, I got Everett in the game. I got some guys. I started mm-hmm. getting them the football, and they started feeling okay about themselves. So you kind of gave them a little breath of fresh air there on that third and 15 conversion. Here, here's another thing that I, I thought was big in the game, too. And you talk about what the Chargers were doing. On those, I mean, it was four in that particular drive. They converted third downs. And on the other side for the Falcons, because you were bludgeoning them so badly in that first quarter, they started to add more guys to the fray. They started to add more – I think they brought in a, a couple extra D linemen. I mean, they were adding linebackers. They were doing a lot of run blitzes. And now you look at it, you go second to 10, second and 11. Here comes third and eight or nine, and that makes it a lot tougher. So yeah. they changed their plan going into that second quarter as well. So Falcons end up – uh, having a really good first quarter, 145 yards of offense, 92 rushing. But then the second quarter, as we talked about, Chargers 166 yards of offense. It was kind of like you poked the bear a little bit, and they came alive. Falcons continue to do what they do all season long, and that's run the football. They've had success. Dave, I want to ask you a question about the presence of, the presence of Cordero Patterson back in the lineup because it seems like Arthur Smith now, he's got options. He's, he's seen enough from Algier. He's seen enough from Huntley to have confidence that those guys can continue to run the rock, and now he's playing a little bit of CP in the backfield, a little bit of CP on the outside. Did you see enough to be encouraged from from Cordero Patterson moving forward now that he kind of gets his legs back underneath himself? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what he's capable of doing. So I asked Arthur on his, on his coach's show, did you have him on a pitch count? And he goes, I wouldn't like to call it a pitch count, but we were monitoring mm-hmm. how much they were using him. So essentially me saying this, it, it was there was some kind of count that he was on as to how much they wanted him – exposed so to speak to the to the contact and how much he was carrying the football but you saw it right out of the block you go no throw backs the first play of the throw game you throw him. fill the hitch <laughs> yeah. route to him outside he gets nine hand it then off you to go him. back and hand it off to him and he runs for about seven so you got no so by do uh, to answer your question we talked a little bit about this last week and i said cp was definitely playing this game you, know, <laughs> I I called it. you, caught I, it. you got it but his versatility in that package is going to expand now and i think you'll see that in the carolina game and that's the part as we get to that and we start talking about carolina That'll be part of the game plan that Carolina hasn't necessarily seen because they didn't see CCP, what, 11 days ago right. when, when we get to Thursday, right? right? I, didn't, I, I didn't get a chance to hear the call of when he runs over the guy. I would have loved to hear. I was which, trying to set that up. I mean, oh, my bad. I was going to say, can we my talk bad. about my him bad. running over <laughs> Drew Tranquil oh on that God. play? Threw him. <laughs> over, <laughs> through, yeah. I mean, through his laid, body. Laid waste. Can you bring laid the wasted. call back? Because I know. I know. I just said, classic. oh, my God. That's all I said. <laughs> Because they had to remove his helmet from his chest. I mean, oh, listen, Drew Tranquil dumb. had a good game. Like, he was all over the yeah. field, made a lot of tackles. Of and there are game, just yeah. certain times when you don't want to run the tape back. Oh, and that's oh. one that Drew Tranquil is never going to want to see again. And conversely, CP going to be showing that one to his kids and his grandkids for years. I thought, I thought it was classic. The Falcons have a mic'd up with Grady this week. And they actually had – they showed him when this happened. <laughs> and his face was like <laughs> – Oh, my God. This grown man just obliterated another grown man. Yeah, the only man. thing I could, I could think of is John Collins posterizing somebody on a dump. Right? And you're going, oh, like that. That's kind of the way it felt. And I know it felt that way to Twinkle. The first thing that hit the ground for Twinkle was his nameplate. Yeah. I mean, boom. And his nameplate was the first back hit the ground. I asked CPA postgame, 
and he just got a big grin on his face. He said, hey, man, he was between me and the goal line. I wanted the goal line. <laughs> I love it. Oh I love it. it. You know, last week I got fired up with a passion with Kyle Pitts, and this one, like, I mean, he got up, threw the football down, and it was like, it's almost like CP is too cool to do it, but it was like he wanted to talk so much oh, mess. Yeah, yeah, he did. So much mess. I mean, the fact you run him over, it still had the wherewithal to, to get the ball over the line. Like, if I ever did that, <laughs> it's kind of too long. late now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, right. You're right. You're right. You're right. But it was unbelievable. unbelievable. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about the offense. Defense, you know, struggling a little bit on third down. Mm -hmm. Dave, let me ask you this. Like, where do they need to sharpen their swords on that side of the ball? Well, I mean, you got to – let's keep it in perspective now. You're not playing with your two best corners, yep. okay? And I don't yep. want to downplay anybody's play. Cornell Armstrong's done a nice job, you know, but let's face it. You have number one guys, and then you have number two guys, yep. and then you have potentially number three guys, which yep. you are playing with some. But I do think that there's some things that they could brush up from a technique standpoint. And, and the big throw was the one after you get TQ's fumble and they get the ball back around midfield. They, they got to get themselves back into field goal range. They go a three by one set and they run Palmer's the third inside receiver. He runs a deep over, or runs a crossing route. Mm. So from a perspective, if if I'm teaching, I would assume if you're John Hoke or whoever you're doing the DB coach or if you're DNPs, you're saying, okay, I cannot give up the inside. Right. And so Cornell, if you look at the play, Palmer gives him a little stutter, stutter step outside. He's already inside already. I mean, just protect the inside. Take yeah. that away. I don't have any help inside. I can yeah. use the sideline as the extra defender if he decides to go that way, and I can funnel him. But he got beat inside right now. Yeah, that's that's what I wrote down. Yeah. It's like he missed – I don't know what the technique was. I said, but I wrote I down he missed the man. jam at the line of scrimmage. Exactly like you got to right. get your hands on him exactly and right. at least mess up the timing at the start. But he got off right away, right. cut inside, and right after you get like a big play, they just like, give it right back up, right? Yeah, well. So well, now you now you and now you can't you don't even have enough time if you're Jalen Hawkins who openly comes down and tries to make the play he can't even get there in time right right because he wins so quickly so now Herbert's getting the ball out before we ever get any pressure um, so yeah it was uh, that from a technique standpoint there's certainly things they can improve on yeah now having the guys out there you would like to have out there well, there's a lot of teams that aren't doing that in fact the Chargers played without their two best receivers right a lot exactly. of that I thought the same thing I mean when you watch the game I thought there were a couple times in crossing routes over routes we were a step behind or the communication wasn't there either you're passing it off or you're not passing it off the technique you talk about I thought was a issue in the game because you think about that last one but there were other plays throughout the game where Herbert climbs in the pocket and he finds a guy over the middle like even just the dig right in the middle you can see Corner Armstrong pointing on that third and 15 like somebody's supposed to come help him. Or is he supposed to go with him? It looked like he was a little unsure on that particular play. So I wonder on the back end, is there still some communication stuff that they have to work out when it comes to plays similar to that? Well, that's what's big about when we talk about it all the time. If we can buy time as quarterbacks for extra time, then it's hard to stay – disciplined in the back end mm -hmm. because if you're an un if you're an intermediate defender a linebacker or a safety that's in that intermediate area and a guy flashes in front of you your eyes naturally if the quarterback's moving up your eyes are naturally to go to him and there's a guy in behind you yep. can you stay disciplined enough if it's a zone mm -hmm. to stay in that area take that throw away make him throw the ball underneath i think those are still some things they're working through it's not a, an overly old team or in a lot of cases, not an overly experienced team mm -hmm. in certain areas. So they're still working through some of that stuff. I do think they had a really good defensive stop late in the game. If you remember, Palmer catches a seam route with about five minutes, six minutes to go in the game, and they get it to the eight-yard line. Mm -hmm. Atlanta bows their back right there and holds them and makes them kick a field goal, which tied the game, yep. as opposed to them <laughs> punching it in and taking the lead. And I thought that was a big moment for the defense. Yeah, and, and you know, we've – I understand it happens, but I as soon as that happened, I thought back to the coup miss mm. that he had because he's just been so automatic yard, yeah. all year. It was a 50-yarder. I mean, that's not a chip shot or anything, but it look, looks like he just pushed it right away, and I'm thinking – if Falcons only had that field goal right now, it could be a different story. Well, and that margin's tighter, yeah. what you're talking about, Rack, because you only had – I think you had nine possessions in this game. Normal NFL games, it's somewhere around 12 possessions. Yep. So if you're going to run the ball as well as we're running it, and let's say the other team runs it to some success, now all of a sudden it it's, it it's, a, it's an eight, nine possession game. And so if you miss shots like that or miss opportunities, you get a guy open in the end zone, you miss him. That comes back and it magnifies itself because right. you're not going to get that many shots, so you have to be that much cleaner when you play.
All right, so we can't really do anything about that one now. Um, it's a loss, as we mentioned. Atlanta falls a game below 500 on the season, now tied with Tampa. An overall record, of course, Tampa uh, holding a slight edge right now. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search, so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. But guys, let's kind of talk, let's move forward because like we said, like the team already has to move forward because as we record, they got a game in about 48 hours or a little bit more than that because they're playing on Thursday night football. Again, it's another one of those situations. You can't make any excuses, right? Short week. Guess what? A lot of teams in the NFL do this every single week. They got to play on a short week. So, but the only difference in here, Arch, is we just played this team, as you mentioned, about 11, 12 days ago. What did Carolina learn from the last game against Atlanta when they lost that you think they're going to try to change their game plan to put out a better performance at home against Atlanta? Well, the front seven will all have neck rolls on because the (laughs) the run game's coming. Yeah. Because in case you didn't watch the Cincinnati game, Joe Mixon just went completely off for a team that does not run the football, Cincinnati. We played them a few weeks ago, and they ran for like 40 yards or something like that in the game. Now, Burrow threw it all over the place. But Mixon just scored five touchdowns, four on the ground. And the the week before that, Atlanta touched him up for 175 on the ground. Oh, by the way, Atlanta just ran for 200. Yeah. What do you think's coming? Run the rock. (laughs) All day long, baby. All day long. Therein lies the advantage for Atlanta. One CP comes back. They didn't see him in week one. So that whatever little nuances, unscouted nuances, you can put him in the game for. But number two, you have got to hit the play-action shots because they're going to do like what what Shock was talking about mm-hmm. where the Chargers put extra guys on the field, bigger dudes to try to stop the run. You're going to have some play-action shots, and you have got to hit them. You can't miss them. We can't overthrow it. We can't overthrow it. We can't drop them. you got to hit them yep. because we talked about limited possessions anyway. Must have, How hard is it? You and I know quarterbacks, and you played quarterback as well, how hard is it to put 12, 13 plays together every time you go on the field? It's yeah. nice to have a couple of drives like that. Right. You get a holding or but something But you need there, some yeah. explosives. You, yep. have to, you have a 30, 40-yard play to shorten the field and give you some energy and some momentum and, and get that other team reeling. Got to hit those shots. Yeah, and, and the personnel is there. I mean, we've seen a more concerted effort to get the ball downfield to Kyle Pitts. Obviously, Drake London can do it. Even the shots that we've got to Demir Bird, OZ has had some opportunities. The guys are there, yeah. but you're right. When they do take the shot downfield, when Mariota finds that guy down the field, they got to find a way to connect or – you got to bail your quarterback out. Like you got to make a better catch, right? Your wide receiver's got to go up over yep. the top of somebody. You got to fight through contact, whatever it may be. DJ, as good as men arts were, but you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> got to help rack, them out. You know, every sometimes, once sometimes in we a while. throw a bad one here and there. You know, Rack, you did it too. I mean, so, <laughs> DJ, let me ask you this question: What adjustments do you think? that Carolina is going to make. Let's take Atlanta's running game out of it. Which What adjustments do you think they'll make, either offensively or defensively, to give them a better chance to come away with a win in this game? You know, I, I think over the time, P.J. Walker, who they said will be starting on Thursday night, I think is a guy that I think they want to use more with his legs. He mm-hmm. hasn't really used his legs at all. I went back and looked at it, and it's five games. He has three attempts for 25 yards. Mm. This is a guy that's considered a guy who can move and run. He doesn't really use his legs. And I think that's a part of the game that I know they want to probably implement because he's a guy that can get on the edge, he can get on the corner. Uh, You've seen other quarterbacks create plays with their legs and arms. Maybe this is a game on a short week where the plan kind of stays similar. Everybody knows when you have these short games, for fans who don't know, there's not really much you do on the field. It's all about getting your body back and prepared, right. ready to go. So the plan is somewhat similar. I already talked about the Falcons game, somewhat similar, but adding a wrinkle here, there with CP. I think they're going to have a similar plan, but maybe now you use P.J. Walker more in the run game and we're on the edge that gives them maybe another uh, what they feel is an advantage in this game to help them. All right, I got a question for you then. Okay, tell me. Baker Mayfield came in the game and played yep. and took him down and they scored two touchdowns. He played pretty well in his relief performance, albeit the game was probably over and you can call it garbage time or whatever, but Baker got some kind of rhythm going. 
So now PJ Walker's supposed to start, okay? And you know that there's probably a much shorter leash mm-hmm. on you potentially in this game. So tell me your mindset as you're going in. Does that make you want to make more plays and all of a sudden maybe you put the ball in harm's way more? Or do you play within the game plan? What do you, what, what do you think his thought process is knowing – the Baker's on the sideline getting ready to come in potentially. Arch, that's a really great question because as a guy who's actually been in that role before, your mindset early goes to, I got to find ways to keep myself on the field. And when that happens, there comes force. There comes you trying to do a little bit more within the play. Now, maybe that may help him. Maybe because in the past he wasn't a guy who was really trying to push the ball down the field or trying to force the ball into those tough spots. I mean, we saw him in the last game uh, that he played here he had a two or three just blatant overthrows or throws he didn't hit that he probably wanted back. And here's a game where you just saw a guy come in who, you know, they brought in for a reason, and now he played solid, you know, in the whatever time he was in. But the mindset is I got to make plays. And whether that turns into him making mistakes or him becoming a better player, we'll have to see on Thursday night. But – and my mindset is every time I'm on the field, I got to make that series count. I got to make that play count because if we're not moving, we're not, you know, getting first downs, we're not scoring points, they're looking, we got to find a way to get in the end zone. And if here comes another quarterback behind you who is capable of doing it. It makes it, it makes it difficult for the mindset of a quarterback, especially when you know they will pull you and another guy can come in. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question that you pose to him, Arch. You guys, you know, kind of talk about it as guys that have been in that situation before. And I know that Atlanta's probably going to prepare defensively for both guys. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're actually okay if they bring Baker Mayfield. Because if you know Mayfield's coming in, he's a gunslinger. Mm -hmm. He's going to take some shots so you Mm -hmm. know you're going to have some chances. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're going to be licking their lips a little bit on that one. You guys talked about quarterbacks. I do want to flip this a little bit because if you remember the last game, there was a certain dude named Foreman that had 26 carries, 118 yards, and three touchdowns. Dave, what adjustments, if any, need to be made so he doesn't hurt them getting into the end zone as many times as he did in the last matchup? Yeah, I think there'll be a ton of study rack on, on their blocking schemes and some of the things they wanted to do. We obviously misfit the run a number of times. It gave him some creases. There's also going to be the ability for them to use what I was talking about for us to use, and that's play action Mm -hmm. because we're going to be wanting to stop the run. That's our number one concern. So what does your personnel look like? Do you change personnel a little bit if you're Dean Pease, maybe a little bit bigger players on the field? Does Troy Anderson find himself on the field and all of a sudden you got that five linebacker set? Or do you go away from that and put an extra defensive lineman on the field to create some clog up in there to where the linebackers can get, you know, you can hang up some of those second level blockers so the linebackers can flow to get to fill some of these holes. And then the other part of it is, are you creeping the safety out? Yeah. You know, because if you see teams and we talk about it all the time, shock, if they, if teams want to play too deep, you got to be able to run it on them. Yeah. If they're going to play cover two or cover four, you got to be able to run it. Cause they don't have that, that eighth guy to get in there. Yeah. But does Atlanta shift to more single high safety? And now all of a sudden Richie Grant, and or Jalen Hawkins is in the box. And so and that's what they're thinking, too, mm-hmm. over there. Okay, how yep. can I take advantage of that yep. with DJ Moore potentially or somebody like that? Let me let me go back and pose a question to Arch. Okay. Going Uh-oh. back to P.J. Walker. Now, you talked about obviously having another guy come in. Last week he throws three interceptions. You're talking about being able to use the play-action game to push the ball down the field. Kind of twofold. On the Falcons' side, are you in the mindset of, okay, this guy just threw three picks – he's probably not going to throw it in danger. He's not going to throw it down the field. Or if you're P.J. Walker, you threw three interceptions, are you concerned about throwing the ball down the field? I'm, not, I'm concerned, number one, about the run because that was the only way they hurt me in the game other than the long throw that was a stupid mistake and they beat us down the field. Mm-hmm. And the other guy I'm worried about is D.J. Moore. So where is Moore lined up? And, and Atlanta actually began to double him late in the game. You saw right. it. They began to actually literally double. I hear guys say, oh, he's double covered. No. That's where two guys are coming from the same zone to a receiver. That's not double coverage. When you actually clamp a guy, where you walk a guy out, and they actually were doubling him inside and out, because that's the guy he wants to throw the ball to. So you pay attention to where he is and then stop the run. And if they can make some plays, God bless them down the field. Make them make those plays. Are you cautious after throwing three picks the previous week? Probably, yeah. <laughs> Probably. That's a hard well, yeah, one to work it, out. Well, it goes back to what you guys are talking well, about. Well, especially if you haven't played very much, right? If, if it's P.J. Much. Walker or it's Josh Allen. 
right? right. Like that's a different story. Exactly. Like if you're Josh right. Allen, you go back there and you're just, you keep slinging you're it, chucking it, baby, because yeah. well, you ain't got to worry about nothing. You, and you've played a ton, right? Yeah. PJ Walker's only what started five games in yeah. his career, and maybe his future's in the balance and all. I, I mean, like you said, Josh Allen ain't worried about the <laughs> yeah. future. He's good. He said they're, they're expecting me to throw the rock. Yeah, that's true. All right, so those are kind of some of the big picture elements that we see coming down on Thursday night as the Falcons go on the road, face the Panthers again. Is it difficult to beat a team, last question, twice in a season and even more so this close together? Yeah, it is because obviously in division it makes it even harder because you know the personnel, you know what they want to do. I mean, ours just we just talked about their entire personnel and what they want to do. I'm sure they over there saying the exact same thing. Here are their group of guys who they want to get the football to, and this is how they're going to do it. Here's some of the sets that they're going to show us. And with it being so close, you can expect it kind of to be similar. So, yes, it's absolutely hard on both sides with the short amount of time and who you're playing to beat a team twice like that. So, DJ talked about it. This is, you know, it's a different week in preparation. It's a much more mental week. You've got to learn off the tape. You've got to go through some walkthroughs in practice, and then you just got to trust your preparation and go out there and uh, be ready to fight and come away with a victory. Then afterwards, hopefully you get a chance to kind of unload, get your body back underneath yeah. you a little bit. And then uh, even more so, we'll be back here to hopefully talk about another victory. Yeah, yes, by sir. By the way, I'm not worried about their mindset. I yeah. keep hearing this drives me crazy when people start talking about the other team's mindset. Who cares what their mindset <laughs> is? They got their ass kicked here. True. Okay. Yeah, okay. It didn't, it did, went kind of weird the way we won it. But they lost, okay? And then they just got their rear ends handed to yes. them last weekend. I don't care what their mindset their mind. is in the Queen <laughs> City or whatever it is up there. We're coming. Get ready. Yeah, yeah. They got enough to think about correcting some mistakes that they made last week. So that's that's the story of the NFL. Who makes the least amount of mistakes and then who makes the plays down the field. So we'll see how that ends up shaking out. That's going to do it here uh, for the Falcons Audible presented by at and We appreciate however you get your podcast material. Continue to like, subscribe, review Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com and YouTube and uh, we'll be back here to break it all down next week and hopefully these guys will have all of their best analyst cap on. Yes, sir. Great work, fellas. How about them dogs? How about them dogs? How about them dogs? <laughs> DJ. Uh, yeah, by the way, Georgia Bulldogs. <laughs> Hasn't been released yet. Number one in the Talk country. Talk to me. Number one in the country. Dave, you may, you went out on a limb last week on CP. I'm going to go out on a limb. Uh-oh. Georgia Bulldogs. Oh, that's it. Oh. Wow, that limb is about that big around, by the way. No, that, that's called a tree stump. I'm standing on a tree stump. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next week.